Hello, it's 8 p.m. in Jerusalem, 7 p.m. in Paris, and lunchtime more or less in New York. Wherever you are, welcome and good evening, or good day, and thank you for joining us. I'm Akin Ajay, and I'm a co-editor of the Tel Aviv Review of Books. Over the next five Sundays, the, no the National Library of Israel and the Tel Aviv Review of Books will be hosting some of the most leading exponents of the art of translation in Israel, who will be talking about their craft and their relationship with the Hebrew language. Over the coming weeks, our guests will be talking, and our guests will include translators of poetry, nonfiction, contemporary prose, and the translation of works in Arabic into English. This Sunday, it's a privilege to have with us the distinguished translator, literary critic, biographer, and novelist, Hilo Harkin. The translator of more than 60 books in Hebrew and Yiddish, it's been reported that a leading Israeli author stopped using Hillel as his translator because he had a feeling that Hillel was in competition with him. I think the scope of Hillel's work as a translator can best be grasped from Robert Alter's observation about Hillel's 2010 biography of Yehuda Levi. Alter says that with the translations that it incorporates, the book gives a vivid and persuasive sense of Yehuda Levi that should make him more real and more understandable than he has been until now. Hello, good evening and welcome. I'm not sure if you can hear me. I think you hear me now, I can. Absolutely, I do. Good evening, Hilo. Thank you so Good much. Good evening, Akin. We've had a lot of problems here with the uh, Zoom, but we seem to have solved them just in time. Well, we got them the end. Thank you very much for your time. It's very much appreciated. And it's an absolute I, privilege to have you with us. I've lost you. Oh, dear. Let's see. I don't hear you. Can you hear me now? I hear you yes. now. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And apologies for the site technical snafu there. Hello, thank you so much for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure having you to chat with us this evening about your life and your work. Um, well, good to be with you. Brilliant, thank you very much. Just remember, remind, a reminder to the audience that um, if you've got any comments or, ch or questions, please do slot them in the chat facility and we'll try our best to get to them before the end of the evening. Um, Hello, in preparing for this interview, you were kind enough to share with me the text of an essay that she wrote about the challenges of translation. Um, in this case, it was a short story by Mendele Hamokhe Aswarim. In a rather poignant passage, you commented on the end of a great literary tradition, and I quote, the confidence of Hebrew authors that they are witnesses to and facilitators of the survival of an ancient heritage in the life of their own age. Now, it seems to me that this responsibility possibly sits with the translator of Hebrew, poet, Hebrew literature as much as the author and maybe in some ways even more. So to start off, maybe a not so simple question. What is it that makes a Hebrew translator? I'm trying to think of exactly what you mean when you, you ask that. What makes a Hebrew translator as opposed to a translator in another language? Um, not so much that I'm thinking about what worlds of knowledge and awareness does a Hebrew translator draw from? Um, what is it that engages them? What are the, you know, the known unknowns that we must negotiate in the course of their work? I think, Akin, one has to make a certain distinction here between contemporary Israeli literature and uh, pre-Israeli or more traditional Hebrew literature of, of a pre-Israeli period, because they, they call in a way for very different um, approaches. If you're translating contemporary Israeli literature, on the whole, apart from a, a good knowledge of uh, spoken and written Hebrew, of course, I don't think that your problems are very much different from what they would be as a translator of French or Spanish or any other literature. Uh -huh. If you're translating older Hebrew literature, on the other hand, that is Hebrew literature from the early part of the 20th century and backwards, and I've done a lot of this, then you already have to deal with a literature that is constantly drawing on Jewish religious tradition, on 
sacred and uh, semi-sacred Jewish texts. And you have to have some familiarity with them, some familiarity with the way in which they're being used and quoted and referred to. Now, in this context, you've translated quite a bit of contemporary Hebrew literature, Shulamit HaRevan, Amos Oz, Aleph Bet Yeshua. And of course, you've translated a lot of what you term traditional or classic Hebrew literature. What engages you more? Uh, although I must say that there are several contemporary Israeli works, uh, such as Shulamit HaRevan's uh, biblical trilogy that I've enjoyed working on immensely. But on the whole, yes, classic Hebrew literature uh, engages me more, interests me more, and gives me a greater feeling of responsibility when I translate it. Responsibility is a quite interesting word. Could you tell me a bit more about that? Well, when you're translating a classic author, which is also to say a, a, a dead author, an author who has probably died anywhere from 50 to 100 to 150 or more years ago, uh, you're the only voice he has, first of all. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he doesn't have the ability to speak for himself apart from you. He can't appear in a newspaper interview and he can't appear in a television interview and he can't look for another translator in case he doesn't like your work. So uh, he depends, or she, if it's a woman, although very few classical Hebrew authors are women, no, uh, he depends entirely on you. You're his voice. And uh, it's up to you to transmit, uh, uh, either successfully or not, a very valuable part of uh, Hebrew literary tradition. If you don't succeed, that author is unlikely to get another chance because uh, classical authors on the whole, although they're, they're very important, but they do not sell well on the whole. Mm -hmm. Publishers are not eager to translate them. And it, usually they get only one chance, that's it. And, and, the, and the chance is you, their translator. Absolutely. A slightly perhaps provocative question. Tell me what it is about the essence of traditional Hebrew literature that is important to be kept alive, to be preserved through translation. Well, traditional Hebrew modern literature, let me say, because we're really talking about a literature uh, I mean, modern Hebrew literature is, is born in the 19th century. That's when Hebrew literature first be begins to try to do many of the things that European literature does, to write novels, um, to write essays. Poetry is slightly different because Hebrew always had that. But traditional classical Hebrew literature, which begins in the 19th, mid 19th century, and let's say runs 75 years or so until the end of the first quarter of the 20th century, is a literature in constant touch with and uh, communion with and interface with the Hebrew texts of all the great Hebrew texts, the Bible, the Talmud, the Midrash, uh, and the Hebrew philosophical works. That is, this is a literature being written by people uh, who all had a considerable rabbinic traditional yeshiva type education. They couldn't have written Hebrew in Eastern Europe without such an education. It was only such an education that gave them the, the ability to write in Hebrew. But as a result, they had a tremendous a command of the great Jewish sources. And their literature is constantly being written uh, against, playing against these sources, with these sources, using them, sometimes mocking them, but always, always in connection with them so that you have to know the sources in order to translate the, the more modern authors who are constantly communing with these sources. Right. Now, something that strikes me is the positioning of translating this dialogue, parts as an anthropologist, but also possibly parts as a gatekeeper in the sense that what resonates with translator may be what it becomes part of a canon as it were. And as we know, and as we acknowledge now, we increasingly acknowledge Judaism is very, very pluralistic. Indeed, you've written about this in great detail in your wonderful book about the lost tribes. What can the translator do to 
ensure that there is a plurality of Jewish tradition coming through without at the same time possibly losing sight of the actual core of Jewishness? Well, you know, when you say that Judaism is very pluralistic, uh, it certainly was very pluralistic in ancient times, mm -hmm. and it certainly is very pluralistic today. Right. Uh, in the interim period, which includes the entire medieval period, there were certainly many currents of Judaism, but, but the only one that really has survived considerably in textual form and then shaped the Jewish people over the ages is the rabbinic tradition. And yeah. that is not pluralistic, really. It has many voices in it, but it's a very coherent and uh, consistent tradition. Mm -hmm. And on the whole, uh, that taken against the background of the Bible is the tradition that classical Hebrew authors are working with. Right, right, thank you. Let's move on to something a little more, a bit more narrow. Let's talk a bit about you a little bit. Um, you were born in New York in 1939. Right. Went long to, time ago. <laughs> a long time ago. You went to the Bronx High School of Science. You studied literature at Columbia University. Um, you taught for a while in, I think, a segregated school in the deep south of the United States. I, ta I taught for one year at Tuskegee College in the early 1960s. Oh, it was yes. a black college in southern United States. It was actually the first black college to be created after the Civil War. And uh -huh. Yes. And the Tuskegee was in the news quite recently in terms of um, some of the indignities that South African Americans have suffered over time. Um, but what I was going to say is that you've also traveled widely in North America and Central America, and you studied for a while in England, I believe. Now, forgive me for sounding a bit presumptuous, but I'm curious about how all these pieces come together in making who is now a translator of Hebrew and somebody who's working with the great Hebrew traditions. Could you say a little bit about that? Well, I, I would say that a, a translator essentially draws on his whole life uh -huh. when he translates. You draw on the entirety of your reading, the entirety of your literary experience, and to an extent on your non-literary experience, because in looking for equivalence in the English language, if you're translating into English, mm -hmm. uh, in many, particularly in difficult cases where it's hard to find an equivalent, you often have to, to draw on sources that uh, are not immediately available to other translators. Every translator, in other words, has his own private dictionary, his own private encyclopedia, his own private reference works, and you often have to draw on them. Uh, I can actually, if you'd like, give you an, an interesting example that I was just thinking of. Absolutely, please do. I was once translating a uh, Yiddish story by Shalom Aleichem, you know, one of the great, great Yiddish writers. And a, a writer who writes in a comic mode, although he's a very, very serious writer. Shalom Aleichem has one story about a, it takes place in, in Eastern Europe in a little shtetl about an arsonist, <laughs> a man who uh, basically makes a living by periodically burning down his businesses so that he can claim the insurance. And this man refers to what he's doing as making, in Yiddish it would sound like making boire ma'ore ha'ish. In modern Hebrew you'd say making boire ma'ore ha'ish. What is boire ma'ore ha'ish? In the Havdalah prayer on, on Saturday evening when you end the Sabbath and you begin the weekday, uh, you light Part of the, the Haldala's, Haldala's service is you light a candle. The, the person chanting the prayer lights a candle, which is forbidden on the Sabbath himself, and holds his fingers up to the light of the candle and says a, a blessing, you know, blessed art thou, o Lord our God, who createth the light of fire. <laughs> now, of course, this is a comic reference in Shalom Aleichem. This man is burning down his businesses. And he says he's making bore, bore mare haish. And I looked at this, as often happens in, in uh, translating cla Hebrew classics, and I said, what am I going to do with this? How does one convey this in English? 
And I thought and I thought, and suddenly out of nowhere, a childhood ditty, a, a little childhood poem that I rem remembered from my Jewish elementary school came to me. It was uh, sung to the melody of Hatikva, the Hebrew national anthem. And if you'll excuse my voice, I'll, I'll even sing it to you now. It went, once, uh, it was in a Yiddish accent. Once I had a candy store business, it was bed. Along came a friend of mine, this is what he said. I hear you got a candy store, but you don't want no more. Take a match, give a scratch, no more candy store. So <laughs> I suddenly said, hey, that's it. Take a match, give a scratch. <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. And I took this reference to Boremo Rehaish, and I turned it into, I'll, I take a scratch, I take a match and give a scratch, which is a recurrent refrain in the, sto refrain in the story. It, it's because <laughs> every time the character burns down another, the business, he once again says, I made Boré Moresh, or in my translation, I took a match and gave a scratch. Uh, it worked pretty well. But, you know, it's a, it's a lucky, it's a question of either you have a certain experience, or you have a certain something in your life that supplies a solution to a problem. You don't. If you don't, you look for something else. Nobody else would have, have translated the Shalom Aleichem story that way, because nobody else would have remembered the particular little song from my childhood that I remembered. Quite, quite. Of course, what's interesting is that that gives a really clear sense of the individual thumbprint that an individual translator brings to their work. But there's something else that strikes me, which you haven't mentioned, which is beyond your own repertoire, your own reservoir of knowledge. It's also a sense of what will resonate easily with your audience. And that's actually quite interesting as well. When you translate a work, do you have an archetypal reader in mind or an archetypal audience in mind? I don't think I necessarily have a archetypical reader in mind, but I am very aware, I think, that when I'm working as a translator, my first responsibility is to the reader and not to the author I'm translating. Uh -huh. My, my job is to create something in English that will be readable, that will be pleasurable, that will be instructive, or that will be a literary experience, and it will be as far as possible true to the original text. Mm -hmm. But whenever I have to make the choice, I mean, this is the classic uh, translational problem of fidelity versus freedom. I will always come down on the side of freedom. Whenever I have to make a choice between the reader and the author, I will always choose my reader. And what happens in such a situation if you're working with a live author rather than a dead author? Well, when you work with a live author, uh, you often run into problems, especially if it's a live author who knows English and who wants to review your work, which many live authors do. Uh, I must say, on the whole, I don't enjoy doing this. Right. I much prefer dead authors. And if I must work with a live author, I would really prefer the live author who doesn't know any English, or at least doesn't think he knows English better than I do. <laughs> but uh, many live authors do know English well mm. and want a say in what you do with their work. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I've worked very intensely with some live authors. It's, sometimes it's been a very pleasant experience, sometimes less so. Uh, it depends on the author. Uh, some authors, and I'll speak of individuals, uh, I've worked both a lot with Amos Oz. Well, I did one book of Amos Oz's, but I've worked a lot with uh, A.B. Oshua. Yes. Their approach is very different. When I translated Amos Oz's A Perfect Piece, Menucha Nechuna, when the translation was done, Amos Oz came up to Zichron Yaakov, where I lived, found a room with a neighbor, and we spent a week in which literally Amos asked me to read every sentence of the translation to him out loud and often commented on it. And then we would have discussions, sometimes arguments uh, about how to, how to do this, how to do that. He was very firm about his opinion, so was I. Sometimes I would give in, sometimes he would, sometimes we'd reach a compromise. 
but he was very, very hands-on in his trans in his <laughs> interventions. Yes. Aleph Bet Yoshua, A B Yoshua in the land cared very little about what I did. His his uh, approach was always, you're the translator. It's your job to do my book. And I don't I, I to tell you the truth, I don't think uh AB Yoshua ever really looked carefully at my translations. He uh -huh. certainly never went he certainly never went over with them with me. Hmm. And I like that much better, frankly. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's not that Amos Oz didn't sometimes, I mean, he was a very good reader. His English was excellent. And sometimes he picked up perceptively on points. Sometimes he enabled me to improve the text. But often I just felt that it was a nuisance. You know, I was constantly having to explain myself and defend myself against an author when I knew exactly <laughs> what I wanted to do. And, and I had to convince the author all the time that it was the right thing to do. That's actually fascinating because it gives a sense of translation as at least partially intuitive and explaining or describing or justifying intuition can be a bit of a challenge, I suppose. I think it's very intuitive. You know, I'll tell you something interesting, Akeem. Yes. Not naturally, you do a translation. After I, in, in, the, in the weeks or maybe even months after I do a translation, even if it's, if it's particularly if it's a translation I've worked hard on, I will remember the translation almost by heart. Not the original Hebrew or not the original Yiddish, but the English, my English, yes. And then gradually it fades. Mm -hmm. So that after a year or two, I won't remember it at all. But after 10 years, you show me a, a translation that I did in which one sentence has been changed or tampered with, I'll sense it immediately. Well, I'll, say, I'll say, I don't remember what the original sentence was, but I know what I'm looking at isn't me. So that translators have styles. It's a curious thing because you would think that a translator's job is to subordinate himself entirely to the original text. And in a way that's true, but nevertheless, translators have styles, they're recognizable. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if I look at a text and it's not my style, I know immediately that I didn't do it. Mm. Do you remember your first work of translation? Yes, very well, as a matter of fact. Uh, you tell. You tell. I, re I, remember, <laughs> I remember both my first, uh, the first work that I actually did was a short Hebrew short story that uh, I was never paid for because the author who commissioned it was robbed on a visit to New York and lost all his money uh -huh. and, couldn't, and couldn't pay me. But the first paid work was a, a book called... Uh, in Hebrew, the, the story of a fighter, and, and it was translated in English as, I think, the story of a terrorist. It was an autobiography by a woman named Gula Cohen, who was a Knesset member for many years and a well-known figure on the Israeli political right. And she was a member of the Stern Gang, the Lehi, when she was younger. And she wrote about her experiences, and I translated it. This was in 1963 or four. And yeah, that was my first paid translation. I got $1,400 for it and I was very proud. How did the commission come about? The commission came about because I had done one or two Hebrew short stories that were published in an anthology before that. Mm -hmm. There were very few uh, Hebrew English translators at work at, at the time and, very, and even less who were any good. Uh, and the publisher somehow heard and, and turned to me. Uh, almost all of my uh, offers to proposals to translate something have come from translators, very rarely from the authors themselves. From, not from translators, from publishers. From publishers. Uh, yeah. Interesting question that comes to mind now about the translation of a title from Luhame, a fighter, a warrior, to a terrorist, which is a much more loaded term, I think. Do you have a say in a publisher's inclination or instinct to edit your translations after you've worked on them. You're here talking about the translation as a whole, not not the uh, not the title. Not necessarily the title, the translation as a whole, but the, the title prompted that question. Yes. Uh, well, you have you have a very limited say. I can again give you. Uh, an example, uh, I mean, this again has to do with the same novel of Amos Oz's that I translated. And uh, it ended badly because it ended in a quarrel between Amos Oz and I that we took us many, many years to patch up. But what happened was when I, I did the translation and Amos Oz, as I told you, spent uh, nearly a week with me mm -hmm. going over it sentence by sentence. Mm 
and when it was finished, announced that he was very, very satisfied with it. And several months later, uh, I was sent the, uh, the galley proofs to go over by the publisher. I think it was Hark Harcourt Brace Jovanovich. And I looked at it and exactly what happened to me was exactly what I described before. I said right away, this isn't, you know, I looked at many of them. I said, these aren't my sentences. What happened? Mm -hmm. So I called Amos Oz and he said, oh, yes, the, uh, the editor decided to change a lot of things. And I, uh, I said to Amos Oz, but we agreed on, on this text. He said, no, well, he said, I, I kept, couldn't help it. This was the editor's decision. And I called the editor and we had a long talk. But uh, the, the editor was a woman uh, stuck by her guns. And in the, in the end, the uh, translation was published that I was not happy about. I almost asked to have my name taken off of it, but I couldn't because contractually that was not possible. Mm -hmm. But it was the uh, last time I translated anything from Amos Oz and it, it, it left me with a very bad feeling. So that does happen, yeah. Do you feel when you talk about a bad feeling, do you think it, it impugns on the integrity of your work? In this case, yes. I think uh, a translation appeared with my name on it. Mm -hmm. That was in some ways not my translation. Changes had been made in it that I would not have approved of. Hmm. Oops, sorry, someone's got cut through. Um, you made it there to Israel in 1970, and you settled in Zichon Yaakov, where you still live today, 50 years later. I'm interested in the influence that idea made on your work, or to think about it from the opposite point of view, whether your work influenced your decision to make Aliyah to Israel. I work again as a translator. Yes, as a translator. Although, to, even in saying that, I think that to some degree, I suspect that to some degree, your work as a translator, your work as an essayist, your work as a writer, are interconnected in different ways. So, I, I think the, sec the second of your uh, two alternatives is more applicable than the first. That is... Uh, hmm. I don't know. I mean, obviously, I, I came to Israel in 1970 with a good command of Hebrew. I grew up in a, uh, I had a very strong Hebrew background as a child and a teenager, and, and I came to Israel with a quite a good Hebrew, not as totally fluent or as free as it is today, 50 years later, but it was good. I, I don't know to, that I can say that my experience in Israel changed me as a translator, but I would say that my connection to Hebrew was a, had a very, played a very important role in my deciding to settle in Israel. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I grew up in a, in a uh, religious Jewish home and I had a, a religious training, religious background. I was Jewishly observant until my teenage years and then I broke with it. And there were many years when I was, I think, felt quite far from Judaism. And the, the one thing that really kept me all the time in touch with Jewish tradition and even with Israel and with my own inner Jewish self was Hebrew, which I always had a great love of, mm -hmm. uh, always felt as was, was a second language that was almost as much a part of me as my first language, English. And there were years in which I think it was Hebrew that, that kept me <laughs> I wouldn't say kept me as a Jew because I would have remained a Jew in any case, but, but kept the Jewish part of me most alive and, and vibrant. Uh -huh. Really interesting. For years in which I was you know, very involved in American life and I, uh, Israel was quite far from my mind for certain years and it was Hebrew that, that kept me in touch all those years. Hmm. You talk about, so you mentioned Hebrew as a second language and that's a fascinating point I'm going to come back on later on. But I just want to read something to you that you commented on in an essay you wrote for the Jewish Review of Books not very long ago called Winter Vigil. You were writing about um, Kogan's work. Um, if I may, you said, yes. you wrote, it wasn't that we were embarrassed by our Jewishness or went out of our way to hide it. We just didn't know what to do with it or where to put it. It had no obvious relation to the Americans we were or wanted to be. Could you say something about how Hebrew allowed you to be the Israeli that you have become? Well, I'll put it even in a, in a wider context in which Hebrew plays a role. 
you know, one, one of the great difficulties, I think, for immigrants to any country is that they essentially lose their childhoods. Uh, because they come to a new country as adults, and it's a country in which their childhood scenery and their childhood world is, is not there. I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's simply gone. It's part of a past that can't be retrieved from anything they see around them. Around them. Because I had a, a childhood in which there was so much Hebrew and so much Zionism too, because I grew up in a very, very strongly Zionist home and I uh, attended Zionist summer camps and Zionist institutions. Coming to Israel in some ways was not losing my childhood, but getting my childhood back. And uh, Hebrew was a big part of that because Hebrew was a big part of my childhood too. So that I think the whole immigrant experience for me in Israel was very different from that of, of most or at least many American Jews who settle in Israel because I, I, right, I right away was, was in an environment that in some sense had always been mine. I see. Um, you prefer working with dead authors to live authors, which makes this question quite easy then, because there's no risk of offending anyone who is still with us. What particular works have you really enjoyed working on? Or conversely, what particular works have you been obliged to do but found quite a challenge, to put it politely? Never been obliged to do a dead author that I didn't want to do because oh. uh, one, one, one has to be enthusiastic about dead authors to convince a publisher to do them or that you should be the person to do them. But I think the author I've most enjoyed working on, and I mentioned it before, is Shalom Aleichem. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and these were translations from Yiddish. Shalom Aleichem is, is just the most marvelous writer because he is both extraordinarily funny and extraordinarily profound at the same time. His, his, his writing is uh, constantly bubbles on the surface, but has great, great depths. I think no one knew the Jewish people like Shalom Aleichem did. And no, no one felt both the comedy and the tragedy of Jewish existence the way Shalom Aleichem did. You know, all, all comic writers, all great comic writers, I think, have a great sense of tragedy. Comedy is often a way of dealing with, with tragedy. Right. And... Uh, Shalom Aleichem, for me, translating him was, it was like drinking champagne all day long. Uh, it was just marvelously enjoyable every moment of it. Uh, partly because I loved him so much and identified so much with, with him and his writing that I, I was able to take great liberties that this uh, story of the strike a match, take a match, strike a match, Take a match, give a scratch. Uh, it's, it was Shalom Aleichem. That was a, a story of his. And I did things with Shalom, like that with Shalom Aleichem all along. Mm -hmm. uh, Shalom Aleichem, if he told a joke or, or if there was some something funny in his story that I couldn't translate, I would make up a joke of my own or I would find a place 10, 10 lines later where I could do something humorous that he had done 10 lines earlier that where I couldn't do it. Uh -huh. I, I felt total freedom with him because I felt almost that I was a successful impersonator of him, that oh. I was being I was being Shalom Aleichem, being it with his approval. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I did one thing uh, with, with Shalom Aleichem that I've almost I've never done with any other author, and that I I, uh, I have almost never confessed to, although I think there is a footnote on it in, in my introduction to Tevye the Dairyman. But Shalom Aleichem's uh, most popular work was really uh, his collection of nov novelistic collection of stories called Tevye the Dairyman, which became the uh, basis of the uh, musical Fiddler on the Roof. Yes. And... Uh, the last of the nine stories, I think, that make up the series exist in two versions. Shalom Aleichem wrote two different versions of the story. Uh -huh. Neither is complete by itself, but put together, they do add up to a complete whole. Mm -hmm. The only problem is that when you put them both together, they're not seamless. <laughs> There's a gap between them 
where one ends and the other begins. Right. And I and my great chutzpah decided to fill in the gap. And I wrote two paragraphs <laughs> of my own in the style of Shalom Aleichem, which went into my translation as part of Shalom Aleichem's story uh, and got away with it because it doesn't seem to have bothered anyone. And I think it's, it least of all would have bothered Shalom Aleichem, whom I think would have stood by my side and patted me on the shoulder and said, good work, good work. Uh, but you know, no translator is supposed to do such things. But you did, because you felt that it was the best thing to do under the circumstances. It was the best thing under the circumstances. As I say, I felt so much that I was able to impersonate Shalom Aleichem that I was totally confident of my ability to, to write two paragraphs in his name. Uh-huh. Shalom Adechem is incredibly evocative of a specific time and a specific place. What today is the value in continuing to work on the text, in reading his text, in possibly retranslating them, engaging with them? What can the reader take from them today in your mind? You, you can you can ask that uh, came about any classic novel in any language. I mean, uh, is, any nineteenth-century European writer is dealing writes about a reality that no longer exists, whether it's Flaubert or Stendhal or Balzac or Dostoevsky or Tolstoy or Shalom Aleichem. Sure. In all these cases, this is a gone world. So it, it's it's not really just a question about Shalom Aleichem. It's a question about the. The, the past and the literary past in general. And, uh, and, and and you're asking here, what value does the past have? I can only say that it has great value because it's an important part of the human experience and of the human experience that gave birth to our own human experience, which grew directly out of it. Indeed. And we, we simply enrich ourselves and widen our perspective by being familiar with it. Indeed. Um, I suppose what my question is, and I admit I'm being slightly provocative here, um, perhaps I'm paying this bit of a devil's advocate, is that, is there a danger in valorizing the past at the expense of the present in translation? Valorizing the past? Valorizing the past in creating a sort of nostalgia, um, rosy tinted nostalgia, which may not necessarily be entirely relevant to our concerns and our needs today. Not that it is unnecessary, but um, perhaps it is entirely possible to place it as one of a broader perspective, one aspect of a broader perspective in writing or in translation. Translating Homer or Dante or uh, Shakespeare into a non-English language, is, is that valorizing the past at the expense of the present? Look, I, I, I suppose in some way it is because it's saying, look, the present is not the only thing that matters mm. and contemporary literature is not the only thing that matters. Yeah. There is, there is literature that matters as much or perhaps more that was written hundreds of thousands of years ago. So yes, I mean, that is perhaps valorizing the past at the expense of the present, but but I think it's performing a very valuable service for the present because a present that is blind to the past or that is unaware of the past is an impoverished present as far as I can, can see. Quite, quite. Thank you very much. Um, in 2008, you wrote some influential essay for Coventry Magazine about translation of the Hebrew language. And yes, you note that thanks to translation, it's not possible for a person who speaks only English to acquire complete education in the classics of Judaism, and indeed to keep up with life and affairs in Israel today. But you also point to what you call a historical irony in that, as you put it, that is, and I'll quote from the essay, something you say that's quite profound and he touches on the notion of Hebrew as a second language. You write that as long as Hebrew was the first language of no educated Jew in the world, it was the second language of every educated Jew. But now it has become the mother tongue of millions of Jews in Israel. It has largely ceased to be studied by Jews elsewhere. Which is saying short, and as you put it in a different context, translation is not an unmitigated benefit 
is it possible or how is it possible to negotiate this? I think it's a contradiction really between the value of translation and what is lost at the same time by the act of translation. Yeah, uh, look, for, first of all, translation, as is often has been said, is involves almost an inevitable loss. And the, the greater the work translated, the, lo the greater the loss is. That is, if you're translating something humdrum or mediocre or not particularly extraordinary in literary terms, the loss may be very little or none at all, or there are cases even when a translator can improve a text uh, if the text is not terribly good. But uh, when a text is a great one, then much has to be lost because when, when you're working with a, a master of language, you can only hope to transmit so much of what that masterful language consists of. You know, you, you have uh, the old Italian saying, uh, what is it, traduttore traducere, to translate is to betray, and... Yes. So yes, uh, a lot gets lost. It's a translator's job to see to it that as little gets lost as possible. Uh-huh. But I also think, and, and this goes back to the, the passage you were reading from my essay, uh, that translation um, is both a way of letting the world know about us or a particular culture or a particular community or a particular literature. And it's also a way of giving away the secrets of that community and of that literature and of, of that language. Uh, because a language, Hebrew or French or Swahili or, or, or whatever it is, mm -hmm. is, is a, a communal bond in which people communicate with each other in a way that outsiders cannot understand. So that every language in a way is a secret code. It's a, it's a secret code of its speakers. Yeah. Translation breaks that code and reveals it to the world. Uh, it's a great benefit in many ways and it's a great benefit to the speakers of that language themselves because suddenly they're they're no longer isolated and they can be understood and read and appreciated by the world at large. Mm -hmm. But it's also exposed them in, in a way that uh, they've never been before. Uh -huh. and so, um, is this... Translation is an infringement on privacy, you might say. <laughs> That's an, an infringement on collective privacy. That's an interesting thought. Is this secret code still needed today? In your essay, you describe lucidly how it served a very valuable um, purpose in medieval times and across history. Is this still needed today? Well, that's a good question. It's look. It, it's uh, is it important that local national languages be preserved in general? Would it be a terrible loss to the world if we all? spoke English, which we seem sometimes to be on the way towards doing. Wow. Half, half of Israeli Hebrew, or it seems to be translated from English in any case, unconsciously by its speakers. I would say yes. I would say it's, it's a loss, just as the loss of any biological species is a loss, just as the loss of any culture, and a culture is indivisible from its language is a loss. I mean, you know, we, we, we live in a world which has uh, both biologically and culturally developed myriad expressions, all of which are fascinating, all of which are unique. And just as uh, we live in a world which is now destroying biological species all over the, the planet, yes, and every biological species that is destroyed is a lost world, we are destroying cultural species. I mean, uh -huh. cultures are being destroyed constantly around the world by in internationalization, by globalization. And this includes languages. You know, every, every, every year languages disappear from the face of this earth. Most of them are languages we've never heard of. But each one of them is, is, a, is a world. And uh, even when it comes to languages that we do hear of, many of them are threatened, not necessarily by disappearance, but by globalization and internationalization, which 
tends to, uh, in many ways, iron out the differences between languages and make them all sound the same in, in, trans, you know, in translation. So as I say, when I, when I hear Israelis speak Hebrew today, much of what I'm hearing, and I'm particularly conscious of this because I'm an American and I, I know these expressions in English, much of what I'm hearing is English in translation. When uh, Israeli says, Kibalti uh, birkayim karot, I got cold knees, cold, you know, uh, that's not a Hebrew expression, <laughs> really. Uh, and, and I could point to, to hundreds of these things. Yes. Translation damages languages too. I mean, I have to confess, I'm probably guilty of a lot of these on inelegant conversions from English to Hebrew, given that I learned Hebrew at a very late stage in my life myself. That's very good. Would you think, pivoting slightly, that Hebrew would be better served as the lingua franca of the Jewish people in Israel and in the diaspora, rather than as it is, which is the national language, the first language of Jews in Israel, and for many Jews outside Israel, a uh, second or third or subsidiary or non-existent language at all. Well, I agree with you. In theory, it would be a wonderful thing if Jews from all over the world could and did communicate in Hebrew. But that's not the case, and it's not going to be the case for the very simple reason that English really has become an international language everywhere. Every educated Israeli and even many, many uneducated Israelis have a good command of English. They get it in their school system, they get it over the media, television, uh, films, etc. cetera. Uh, whereas learning Hebrew is a very difficult and arduous thing for a Jew in the diaspora. And very few Jews really learn it well enough to speak it well. So when an Israeli meets an American Jew, even if it's an educated, Jewishly educated American Jew, the chances are almost always that the Israelis' English will be better than the American Jews' Hebrew. Right. And in that case, in that case, the natural thing is to do, to do is to speak English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and and I think that's just the way it is. It's not going to change. Mm. I mean, something I should say, speaking from a personal perspective, um, I have no Jewish antecedents, I ha and I had very little knowledge of Israel. Or Judaism until about 20 years ago when I met my wife. And the opportunity to read Hebrew work in translation at a very early stage, including oddly enough, your translation of The Liberated Bride, opened up the world to me in a way that I'm not quite sure anything else could have other than moving to Israel, in the sense that it's moved me from a position where I didn't know very much about Israel to a position where I still don't know very much about Israel, but I know what I don't know, which is a much more valuable position. And so I still, I can understand your pessimism, if it's fair to call it that, but I still feel that nevertheless, there is something in translation that um, well, absolutely. I can look. I'm not really trying to denigrate the act of translation. I many of the books that I love most are books or works that I can read only in translation. Uh -huh. you know, uh, I wish I could. I know I know enough Greek to read Homer in Greek, but I don't. And 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 Homer's Odyssey is to me one of the most precious books in my library shelves. I, yeah. Uh, and, and one could say this about many other works, too, in, in various languages. So mm -hmm. I would be the last one to denigrate the debt that I or anyone owes to, to translation. It's, it's uh, incalculable. I, I would simply, I'm simply pointing out that translation has its downside. <laughs> not that it shouldn't exist or that it shouldn't take place or it's not terribly important. It's all those things. But the there's a price. There's a price for all those things. Indeed. Indeed. Um, we've been chatting off about three quarters of an hour, and I'm conscious of the fact that we may have questions from the audience. So I'd like to open it up to the floor now. Um, I believe Doron, our so technical support, will be helping me out with this. Is that correct? Absolutely. I'd be happy to. Thank you very much. So we have many questions. Um, the first will be, does translating these classic 
Hebrew uh, treasures inspire you to write yourself? And there are more questions that are to the same effect um, as Brian asked, um, how has your work as translator influenced your work as an author? That's, that happens to be a, a very pertinent question because several months ago, I began to write a novel in Hebrew, which is the first serious work of writing I've ever attempted in Hebrew. And it's a novel that takes place in the mind of a translator who is translating an English poem into Hebrew. The poem happens to be William Wordsworth's Ode on Intimations to Immortality. And the whole uh, novel takes place in the mind of a translator as he works on the translation, uh, including all the uh, numerous associations and memories and experiences that this working on this translation evokes in him. So <laughs> yes, there, there's the answer to your question. Thank you very much. Olga asked a, asked a question that's related to this. Um, and she as a translator has difficulty with this as well. She asks, how has your work as a translator affected your experience as a reader? I'm not sure exactly if it's affected my experience as a reader, but I will say that every translator knows that there is no closer reading of a text, no more attentive reading of a text than the reading that a translator gives it. When you translate a text, you're reading it under a microscope. Uh, and you often notice things that you would never notice as an ordinary reader. You sometimes notice things that the author doesn't notice. I, I've, I've translated books in which characters, minor characters, I must say, change their names in the middle of the book. And nobody noticed but me until I came along as a translator. I've translated books in which characters change the name, the color of their eyes in the course of a translation. And nobody, not the author and not any editors and not any reviewers ever noticed this until I did. Uh, so that you're reading in the most intensive possible fashion. Does that spill over into the way that one reads when one is not translating something? Perhaps, I, I've never really given this much thought. Um, you know, reading well is the very opposite of fast reading. Reading well is slow reading. The slower you read the, the, a, a good text or a great text, the better a reader you're going to be. And translating is the slowest possible reading there is. Translating, you sometimes spend several hours reading a single sentence. So that in that sense, yes, uh, I think being a good translator makes you a better reader. Thank you very much. Um, so Roger gave some context. He says, I'm trying to read uh, Kulbach's uh, Zellmeiners. I'm sorry if I've just- Zellmeiners. Yes, in Yiddish, and finding your translation very helpful, he asks, given the variety of dialects and therefore idioms of languages like Yiddish, how do you cope uh, when you come across obscure idioms that you are not familiar with? If you come across obscure idioms that you're not familiar with, this happened actually in translating Kulbach quite a lot because Moshe, Moshe Kulbach, uh, first of all, Yiddish is not a language I'm as totally adept at as Hebrew. I mean, Hebrew is really a, a language I'm entirely uh, fluent in. Yiddish is not. I, I read Yiddish more or less fluently. I don't speak it fluently. And uh, Moshe Kulbach, who was a Yiddish writer writing in the Soviet Union in the 1920s, uses a lot of local Yiddish expressions that I wasn't familiar with. How do you cope with them? You first, you go to a dictionary. If you can't get the answer from a dictionary, you, you try to find a friend. I mean, I have one or two, fortunately, who know Yiddish better than you do, who might even be Yiddishists or experts in Yiddish, and you ask them. Uh, in some rare cases, they won't know either, and you end up guessing. But uh, you try to guess as little as possible. And generally, it, it is possible to, to track down obscure references. But sometimes they're difficult. Sometimes they may be references to historical events that, that are very difficult to, to, to locate anymore. I mean, there may be local events that happened in a particular town or region a uh, hundred years ago and you, you don't know exactly what they were. But you do your best and that's, uh, that's all you can do. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Um, so GE asked a question. The Hebrew language has changed so much over the 50 to 100 years. The translations in Hebrew into Hebrew have been updated frequently. We notice this less about English, but it has also undergone changes. Is there any early work you have translated that you feel you might that might require uh, a new edition or to be understood better? I don't think anything that I've translated reads as if it were in even slightly antiquated English today. Uh, you know, I haven't lived quite long enough for that to happen. But the question raised is an interesting one because it's a whole question of whether a translation is as timeless or should be as timeless as an original. You know, if let's say we're, we're, we're reading uh, Dostoevsky and in, 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 if, if in Russian, Dostoevsky doesn't need to be updated. I mean, there are attempts sometimes to do this or Shakespeare, you know, will sometimes be translated into a, a 20th century idiom, but that never really works very well. Dostoevsky is always best in 19th century Russian and Shakespeare will always be best in 16th or 17th century English. The question is, is a 19th century translation of Dostoevsky, if done by a good translator, does that have an advantage over a 20th or 21st century translation? because the translator of Dostoevsky in the 19th century was working in a world, English speaking world, that was very much the contemporary of Dostoevsky's Russian speaking world. And you would think that in some ways, the language of 19th century England would be more suitable to that, translate that of 19th century Russian than would be the language of 21st century England. Um, but I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Uh, there, there are many contemporary translations that read very well, and uh, I would have you would have really have to sit down and start making comparisons here with 19th century translations of Dostoevsky, 20th century translations, 21st century translations, to see if if the uh, contemporaneity contemporaneity with Dostoevsky is an advantage or not. So I'll, I'll leave that an open question. Thank you very much. Um, Hila wrote, I don't believe that translation breaks of the code of culture and language. It provides a mirror into that culture, allows us to immerse uh, into it as much as possible. Indeed, an invasion of privacy of sorts. However, there will always be the influence of the translator's own culture and the time period in which he writes, thus distorting the authenticity. What are your thoughts on that? I'm not sure I, why does a translator who really knows the culture and the world from which a writer is writing, why does he have to distort the authenticity of that? Well, except, that, of course, in a sense, as we said before, that every translation is a distortion of some sort. Uh, you know, translators know this. Readers... I think generally have the impression that when we're reading a translation, especially if it's a good translation, that they're looking at the original. You know, it's as if the translation is a clear window. And if, if you think of the uh, original work as a story that goes on inside the house, inside the home that this is a window of, the translator creates a, a window that you can look through at the original, at the house in which the, this original work is taking place. And, and according to such an image, the clearer the window, the more the translator polishes the window until it's spotless, the better the translation is. But every translator knows it doesn't work this way. What you're really doing when you translate a work is you're painting on the window. You're painting a, a trompe l'oeil, you know, a, a, a false reality on the window. What you're doing is you're looking through the window at what you see inside, and then you're trying to paint that as best you can on the window so that the reader is not looking into the whole house anymore. He's looking at the window that you've painted. And uh, of course, in this sense, yes, it's a distortion. All translation is a distortion. But the more skillfully you, you paint on that window, the, the, the less the distortion will be, I think. 
Thank you very much. Um, Peretz uh, asked, uh, you have translated Agnon, whose language is that of the Beit Midrash, but whose stories are distinctly modern and modernist. What are the particular issues and problems you faced as translator of Agnon? Is there a register or sociolect of English that works for translating Agnon? I think there's a register, but there's no sociolect. In other words, Agnon writes a Hebrew that is not only impossible in some ways to translate into English, it's unlike any other Hebrew. Agnon's Hebrew in some ways is a personal invention of Agnon's. It's a Hebrew that draws on many strata of Hebrew from the oldest to the to modern Israeli, but it, it, it integrates them in a way that is very peculiar to Agnon. But there's really no way you can communicate this in, in, in English. Uh, Agnon's Hebrew, for instance, is very heavily influenced by rabbinic language, uh, which it constantly plays with and toys with, and sometimes uses ironically, sometimes not. You can't really uh, give an immediate sense of this language in English because English simply lacks the equivalence. English never had a rabbinic culture or never passed through a rabbinic period. And, and therefore there's, there's no way of indicating these elements in the translation, but you can do other things with Agnon. Agnon's Hebrew, for instance, tends to have what I can I would call Talmudic rhythms, a kind of dialectic back and forth, yes and no, this, but on the other hand, kind of movement. It, 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 it's constantly arguing with itself. Uh, this you can do. Uh, Agnon's Hebrew, is it has, has, a, has a lot of irony in it. It has a lot of tongue and cheek quality. Um, it, it often plays with you by making you uncertain whether you're supposed to be taking it seriously or not. This you can communicate in English. These are things that can be done. So I would say that you, you cannot give an entire feel of what Agnon's Hebrew is, but you can definitely give a sense of its tone in English. and. Uh, or what the questioner called its register. And I think this is possible, yes. Thank you. Um, Trudy asked, how do modern authors choose their translators? Well, as I said earlier, it's, it's generally in my experience done by the, the publisher because uh, I would say 90% or more of the works that I've translated I've probably translated 70 or 80 books in my life. 90% um, at least have come on request from the publisher. I would assume in some cases, if not all, that the publisher may consult with the translate with the author in advance and that the author has some say in whom the publisher turns to, but I really can't say because I wasn't privy to that. Uh, there are have been cases in which authors have turned to me themselves. Uh, and to tell the truth, I'm never very happy about this situation for two reasons. Um, one is, as, as I said before, it gives the author a, uh, or makes the author feel that he should have a say over your translation, but I don't think a translator should give an author. Uh, an author who pays you, him or herself, for what you're doing is, is you know, you become their customer. Uh, and, and I don't think that's a good relationship for a translator to be an author's customer. A translator should be a publisher's customer. The second thing is that authors who uh, commission translators directly are often authors who can't find publishers. And they often can't find publishers for good reasons because their work is not often, not always, but often is really not good enough to get published. And then you end up taking an author's money. This is something that I did more when I was younger and needed the money more. You end up taking an author's money with no guarantee that your work is ever going to find a publisher. It may not. And when it doesn't, the author may end up blaming you. And even if he doesn't blame you, you may feel guilty because you took his money and uh, he, he or she was not able to publish the book. So this is not an ideal relationship. And I think a publisher-translator relationship is much better than an author-translator relationship. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Nicoletta asks, were your translations into English used as a base to translate into other languages? Yes, in some cases, although I'm, I may not be aware of, of most of them. The only case that I really know of for a fact was there is a uh, Israeli author named Uri Orlev, who I've translated a large number of his books. Uh, Uri is a uh, writer who writes, has written largely for a uh, juvenile and child children's audience, although he's written some, well, like all, like all good juvenile and children's books are written for adults too. But on the face of it, they're, they're written for juveniles and children, and they've been very, very popular in many, many languages. So some of them, quite a few of them are books about the Holocaust, and the uh, Ori is a Holocaust survivor, and they're extraordinary books in the sense that they really communicate the experience of living through the Holocaust in a way that is, is very meaningful and accessible to, to young, young readers. And Uri has been tremendously successful all over the world. His, his language, because of, I think, largely the interest in the Holocaust and his books have been translated into dozens and dozens of the most far out languages into Tamil and Malagasy and, uh, and, and the police and God knows what. And uh, in, in many of those cases, I think the translations were done from my English because the, the Nepalese or uh, Tagalog translator was simply did not know Hebrew. Um, so those are the cases that I know of. Thank you. Um, Nama asked, do you finish reading the book before you begin translation? I'm laughing because of course you should. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's a great gap in translation as in many things between the ideal and the real. Every translator should, of course, read a book first. But the reality is the translators work for a living. Uh, they're paid by the word, generally, which in itself is a rather absurd system because, you know, in, with, with, with one book, you can, you can translate 100 words in a minute, and then the other book, it may take you two hours to translate 100 words. But they're paid by the word generally. And most translators are in a hurry. <laughs> you're trying to, to make a living. You're trying to work as quickly as possible. Uh, again, particularly in, in when you're not working with great classic works. And what that means is you often feel you simply don't have time or you don't want to take the time to read a book through in advance. And I have translated books. Uh, they're generally books that I have not had the same respect for that I've had for the classics. But I have sometimes translated books that I've just started with page one without reading the book through. Yes. I don't recommend it, but I have done it. Thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you, Aiken, and thank you, Hillel. Thank you all for being here from all over the world. Uh, very impressive turnout from all kinds of different countries. Uh, I will, once uh, you've said uh, your goodbyes, I will open the microphone so that people can ask any further questions they may have or just say hello from all the different places in the world. Once again, thank you so much. Uh, Laila Tov from Jerusalem, and we hope to see you in our next events. Thank am, you. I staying, am I staying with you now? I'd be happy to, but I don't quite understand the arrangement. Absolutely. If people have any more questions, I'm sure they'd, okay, want, they'd like to ask you. Thank you. Fine. Very quickly before Doron opens the microphone, I would like to first of all thank Olga Lempertz of National Library for her tireless work in putting together this series of events, and Doron Levin, who's been very, very helpful in supporting us technically this evening. I would like to thank the audience for your participation and for their astute and very, very interesting and engaging questions. And most of all, I'd like to thank Hilel for giving us the time to share his insights into a lifetime of work. And I think I should mention as well that some of the themes that we've touched on this, eve this evening will are discussed in Hilo's forthcoming book, A Complicated Jew, Selected Essays, which I believe is being published next month by Simon and Schuster. No, it's being published by a small publisher called uh, Wicked Sun Press. <laughs> oh, I do apologize. That's correct. Yes. Um, iPhone certainly, I'm looking forward to reading it. Hello, thank you very much for your time. You're very welcome. It was my pleasure. So there are also many thanks in the chat room. I'll send you both the transcripts so you can read them yourself. And I've opened the microphones. Thank you all once more. Thank you very much. Good evening.
Uh, Hillel, yes. Um, okay. yes. Um, are you philologous? <laughs> so, for many years, uh, philologus' identity was a very, very well kept secret. Um, because uh, Philologus began writing his columns uh, in 1990. And uh, I think for at least the first 15 or 20 years, very, very few people knew who Philologus was. And, uh, and during that period, I would have answered your question by saying, no, I'm not Philologus. Today, I'll simply say no comment. <laughs> We came very close to an exclusive there, but never mind. <laughs> no, it's a, uh, yes. My, my, my wife is standing here in the background. She says, say it. So I'll say it. Yes, I am for all of this. And now we all know. Can Thank you me. just tell us, can you tell us a little uh, briefly, what's that like? What, what is it like being philologist? Oh, it's lots of fun. It's, it's, uh, it's much more enjoyable than uh, other kinds of writing because I don't take philologists very seriously. He probably doesn't take me very seriously either, but the result is that the, re the, the reason that I, I'm writing philologists under a, that I wanted to write this language column under a pseudonym in the first place is largely because I love languages and I'm fairly good at them and I have at least some acquaintance with quite a, a no, large number of them, but I'm not a linguist. And uh, I can't speak with the authority of a linguist or with the knowledge of a linguist. What Philologus had did for me was it, it allowed me to create a persona who could say what he wanted to about languages or come up with whatever theories he wanted to come up with or uh, whatever, uh, points of view he wanted to express without committing me, <laughs> Hillel Halkin, to what he was saying. In a sense, he, I wasn't responsible for Philologus, and I still don't feel responsible for him. Philologus can say things you know, off the cuff or that, that I would never stand behind because I'm not sure that they're really true. But I allow Philologus to say them because <laughs> that, that's who he is. And in general, he has a much, uh, I think, lighter and breezier personality than I do. So uh, he has a kind of alter ego. But yeah, I do write that column. Thank you. Right, so, and so in the absence of anything else, I think we should call it an evening there. So once Aviva again- Aviva has raised her hand. Is it Aviva, would you like to oh. say something? Indeed, yes. Maybe not. I'm sorry. Not at all. Well, in the absence of anything else, I'd just like to once again say thank you to everybody and look forward to meeting you virtually next week. And once again to Hillel, thank you very much.